The Startup Owner's Manual uh, is really a summary of what we now know from the last 10 years of entrepreneurship. When I first wrote The Four Steps to the Epiphany, it almost was a coming-of-age story about somebody who just kind of like said, wait a minute, everything I think we've been doing for the last 40 years is wrong. And it was like, I think we're wrong, right? <laughs> you know, question mark. That was The Four Steps to the Epiphany. And over the last 10 years, it turns out, why well, yes. It was kind of like the scene in the Matrix where you kind of take the blue pill or the red pill. We woke up and realized, oh my gosh, we've been doing the wrong thing for 40 years. And the whole lean startup idea came out of that. The startup reference manual said, well, of course we were doing the wrong thing. So here's the right thing to do. Here's what you do if you're an engineer or even a product manager or someone else starting a new venture, either as a two people in a garage or even in a large company. Here's the step-by-step -step process, not just the theory and not just the big words, but here's what you do on Tuesday, here's what you do on Wednesday, here's what you do getting out of the building, not just kind of get out of the building, here's what you say when you get in your car and you get out of your car, and here's what you say to somebody when you say, so what do you think about my product? And it also tracks the difference between how do you do this if you're building a Android or a web app versus you're building a new electric vehicle. Well, the theory is the same, the processes are radically different because obviously with a website or mobile app you could get feedback almost instantaneously in days and weeks but if you have a physical product you've got to either take along a, a demo or a model or something and you've got to visit people and that kind of feedback loop is longer process is the same the tactics are different so the startup owner's manual literally takes you from the day you have your idea to the day you're like printing money and figuring out you know, what color is the new car? Um, and, and so that's the book. Um, it joins, and I think this is the, the important part, it is not the last book to be written on startup on, entrepreneurship, but it is the beginning and joins the beginning of an entrepreneurial management stack. For the first time, we now understand startups are not smaller versions of large companies. All the advice we were getting for the last 50 years which said, see everything we learned in business school? With all due respect, that was wrong. It was BS. We just didn't know what was different. And what we now know is the large companies execute known business models. But startups don't execute anything on day one. They're searching for something. My definition of a startup now is pretty actionable. A startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. And when you deconstruct that, you come out with some interesting observations. Startup is a temporary organization. As much as fun you're having bringing the dog to work and having dinner with your friends and food in the refrigerator, and it's a small team, the goal is not to be a small team. The goal is to be a large company. So therefore, the startup as an organization is a temporary organization. And why is it temporary? Because you're searching for something. While you think you might be coding or building hardware or talking to customers, no, you're not. Those are all things you're doing, but the big picture you're doing is searching. And what are you searching for? You're searching for a repeatable and scalable business model. So the question is, what the heck is a business model? And a business model says, listen, any company can be described by having nine components. And this is where Alexander Osterwalder's work really is helpful in kind of thinking about a startup. Besides the product you're building, which he gives a fancy name called value proposition, you're selling it to somebody, or somebody's buying it, it's customers. Who are they? Why are they buying it from you? What job are you getting done from them? Or what need are you solving? You know, a spreadsheet solves a problem. A video game, entertainment, solves a need. How are you going to price it? Is it a freemium model? What's the revenue strategy? What are the pricing tactics? How are you going to create demand? That's how do you get keep and grow customers? How are you going to reach the customer? Is it via website or a direct sale or indirect channel? Do you have any costs that you need to calculate? You know, any uh, partners? iPod without content partners would have been another hardware player. Any resources you need, activities you need? Those nine pieces really are part of a strategy. And every startup needs to be thinking about all those pieces. The first two that we always worry about is what's called product market fit. The connection between the value proposition, what you're building, and the customers. Do the customers say, hey, we love that, great. Or do they go, 
what? What, what is that? We, we, uh, or we kind of liked it, but can you paint it blue? And so the first two boxes you tend to worry about are the value proposition and the customer segment, whether they work. And then you worry about pricing and how to demand creation and how do I get people to the site or buy the app or how do I price it, et cetera, and who are the right partners. And, and this is all part of the search process. If you think about what we used to do, investors and venture capitalists used to say, write a business plan. And by the way, when you come into my venture firm, give me a PowerPoint presentation. And what's the PowerPoint presentation? It was nothing more than, here's a summary of my business plan. And a business plan always was a series of declarative paragraphs and spreadsheets. It was kind of like the old Soviet Union five-year plan. It said, here's what I'm going to accomplish in the next five years. Not like maybe, not like here's what I found, not like here's, here's how I got here. It was, here's what I'm going to do. And by the way, if you were lucky enough to get blessed by getting funded, they would give you money to go do what you wrote about in your plan. The reality is we now know no business plan survives first contact with customers. It's all a hallucination. The most successful startups start out with one idea, but learn from their customers and actually go from failure to failure. It's a huge insight about startups. People who've done it know this, but VCs never like said this. Startups don't execute a plan. They learn by going fa from failure to failure and learning from those failures. And we've now given names to those failures. I used to draw them, but Eric Reese did a major contribution by calling them pivots. And, and to me, we, if we use the business model canvas, we could define a pivot very clearly. A pivot is a substantive change to one or more of the business model canvas components. <coughs> Excuse me. A substantive change means, gee, my customer segments weren't teenage boys 15 to 18. They might be middle-aged women, 45 to 55. That's a substantive change. A minor change is, no, they're not boys 15 to 18. They're 14 to 17. Or pricing strategy. It might be we found out the freemium model doesn't work. We might actually have to do direct sales. That's a substantive change. And so when we find these things by learning, by failing, by testing, by testing our hypotheses, those are pivots. Yeah, this one to me is kind of easy because I was confused for my first 20 years as well. So you ought to, um, you meaning in general, your viewers, ought to separate out books that are great war story entertainment. Here's how Google did X, or here's how Steve Jobs did Y. Those are wonderfully entertaining. Isaac, Isaacson's biography about Steve Jobs was just wonderful. I mean, it was just entertaining and whatever. But at the end of the day, there's very little actionable stuff for an entrepreneur. I mean, you can't go live his biography, right? So there's, and, and my point is, there are one class of books that I call, you know, kind of stories or biographies or I was there or whatever. The others, they're strategies. First one I ever read, ever, that pertained to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, I still remember the day I read Crossing the Chasm by Jeff Moore. Um, Moore took some research by previous researchers, Everett and Jones, about technology lifecycle ad adoption and applied it to a specific problem that startups were having when they were trying to scale from the early stage into the mainstream. And for the first time in my career, by then when I'd been an entrepreneur and startup guy for 15 years, I realized that there were patterns that were applicable to me and there were solutions I could use. And so there was a methodology that I could repeat time and again. If I got to this location, my gosh, pick up Moore's book. And so there are several books that are resources for patterns, for methodologies. If you get to step A, you know, pick up this book because we now kind of know what to do here. That was the intent of the Startup Owner's Manual. That was the intent of Alexander Osterwalder's Business Model Canvas. That's the intent of Eric Reese's Lean Startup stuff. That we now have a stack of stuff that are different than war stories that are actually, here's what you should be doing and thinking about as a big idea.